Welcome to the Vanity Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today will be Mike Baxter. He's a hitting coach for Vanderbilt. He's a former Vanderbilt baseball player, also a former outfielder at the major league level, most notably probably for the New York Mets. This podcast episode presented by Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center. Wellspire offers personal and professional development opportunities in a beautiful facility in the Gulch neighborhood. Stop by for an event with world-renowned speakers or host an off-site event that will wow your team or your clients. We also thank our co-sponsor, The Well Coffee House, which turns coffee into water and has a mission to bring clean water to the world. Today's news presented by Sutherland and Belk, an SEC sports-loving injury firm in Nashville. These guys will shoot you straight on your rights and options when you've been hurt in an accident. Call them at 615-846-6200 to get your questions answered. You can also visit them online at sbinjurylaw.com. Vanderbilt and South Carolina kick off in Columbia, South Carolina. Saturday night, that game will be shown on the SEC Network starting at 630 Central. Mike Baxter on the guest line is brought to you by Bowling Branch, started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tan, and had no clue how comfortable sheets could be until I got Bowling Branch sheets, which I've had about six years now. They are fair trade certified. That means they're made under safe conditions by men and women treated and paid fairly. Try them for a month. You can return them for free, but you won't want to. Once you get the sheets, try the mattress. That was voted best mattress of 2018. Go to BowlingBranch.com, that is spelled B-O-L-L, enter the promo code VANDY, and get $50 off your first set of sheets. Mike Baxter joins us now. He is the hitting coach for Vanderbilt. He is a former player for Vanderbilt. Mike, appreciate you joining us. Hope you're doing well. Doing great, Chris. Thank you. It's good to talk to you. Same here. How was the Oklahoma State series? It was good. Uh, Good weekend overall, I think. Uh, we were able to get out there and, and spend some time in the city and uh, do some offset Oklahoma State. It's a good, strong program with some older players, and it was good for us. We were able to get a lot of young guys out there, um, just get them some experience with uh, against another school and just get their feet wet. So overall, I thought it was a, a very solid weekend and, and a good, good experience in the fall. How much fun was last year and just the aftermath of winning a title? The aftermath um, w- was probably less fun than the year was, I think. And, you know, it's funny how quickly you turn the page because obviously the kids leave and, you know, the coaches, we move on to recruiting and, and you know, you kind of get back into the normal um cycle of you know responsibilities pretty quickly after it's over but when you look back at last year I think what was really fun was you know the the nine months we were with the guys uh, from September through June and and how incredible that journey was and just what that group of kids when they were all together and and um, you know just showing up to the field every day just how special that was you know and obviously I've only been on the coaching side for three or four years but Um, you know, I don't take that group for granted because, you know, talking to Corbin Brownie and Dave, guys that have been doing it longer than myself, I think, you know, that group as a whole, they they stood out and and you're talking about 50 or or 60 years of combined experience. I think that group stands out in their minds too, as, you know, one of the best that they've ever had. And not just from a playing perspective, but just from an enjoyability, you know, sense where you're coming and spending time with these kids every day and they were just such a joy to be around. Well, and not just that, that's probably one of the all-time great lineups in the history of college baseball. What is that like, just watching that come together from two years ago through the offseason to seeing the Ethan Pauls and the Steven Scotts come back? I mean, that just had to be quite a ride. It was. And, you know, being around those guys for a longer period of time uh, from an informal role early um, to then a formal role when those guys were sophomores, um, to see to see their or junior student to see their progression um was really cool um and, and really really neat to be a part of and and i think with the two you mentioned specifically um turning the draft down to come back to school um and come back with the plan and, and come back with intentions of um really maximizing their senior year from a team standpoint where uh, you know they wanted to go out and win 
obviously a national championship, but also from a personal standpoint with very actionable types of focus and what they wanted to do from, you know, the player development side um, was really fun to be a part of. Because I think what you find when you get an older player, whether it's a junior or senior, um, you find a, a good discipline from a mentality standpoint where they're able to stay focused and targeted on what it is they want to work on. And, you know, I think one of the biggest journeys for a hitter in general is just knowing who you are. And generally when you get um, an older player back in the program, they have a better sense of who they are and what they do. And they start refining that. And I think that's when you see the, the true talent come out. You came to Vanderbilt as a player in, I believe, 2005. Is that correct? Uh, my first, uh, I played in the 04 spring, so I showed okay. up here in 03 fall. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, but the program's changed a lot since then. That's, those were Tim's first years when you were there. How crazy has it been to see it change from what it was to what it is now? I, I think what's changed a lot is maybe the national perception, um, the day to day style of leadership and expectations from coach Corbin have not changed one bit. Um, you know, that's the remarkable thing. He's on year 18 and his energy for his role and his energy for the program and the way he models behavior um, is very, very similar uh, to what it was 15, 16 years ago. Um, you know, what has changed a little bit from him is, is maybe his style of teaching. You know, I think he's built in a lot more, um, classroom and, and things off the field for the, the development of the player outside of the game, which is cool. You know, obviously I think he's adjusted with time and, and evolved as a coach, but his behavior and his energy has never changed. That's always been the same. And, you know, when I think you look at the program from the outside, um, from a national landscape, obviously I think that has changed as well. Um, but that's, that's been earned through the players in the past that have come in and, and, and really put the program up to a high level and, and created the type of image and brand the program had. Uh, you know, it's a testament to this. Yeah. What has been built. And obviously, our goal every day is to keep moving it forward and, and just try to continue the growth of the program and not just be happy with where it's at. Mike, you were in a unique spot here because. You graduate so many established players from last year, and yet you have talented guys. You have number one recruiting classes every year. You had guys last year like Isaiah Thomas and Cooper Davis who would have played probably literally at any other program in the country but couldn't find the field for you guys. What is that like watching those guys go through that transition, and what's your feeling about where they are at this stage heading into next year? Well, those rankings, you know, we don't really put much stock in the rankings. I think when you get, you know, the outside publications are nice. They, they acknowledge, you know, some stuff. But really, uh, our goal when we get the guys in here, they got to transition into our program. And, and, and that's a challenge for anybody, obviously. And then when you come in and you had a group of players that owned their positions last year and, and held on to their roles, um, those guys had to be patient. And to their credit, they were. And I think when you look up now, there's a lot of opportunity from a, a lineup standpoint um, on both sides of the ball to, to come in and impact the team. So it is exciting to see the guys that were here last year that had access to some of the best players we've had in, in terms of maybe not skill, but, you know, definitely routines and mentality and team, um, you know, to, to see how those guys did it and to be a part of it. Um, it's exciting to watch those young guys now um, take those lessons and, and apply them to our new group of freshmen, um, which is great. And I think, you know, to date here, this fall specifically, I think we've we've been pretty impressed with their their ability to come out and, and train at a high level of focus and energy every day. And I think sometimes what you worry about with a predominantly younger group is their ability to be mentally present uh, consistently, um, but we, we've been very impressed and, and we've been we've been happy with their their attack of training every day. So so that's been good. But I, I do think that goes hand in hand with some of the older players that might not have had a a playing role last year. Um, I think they come in here and and, and they want to create the same environment because they recognized how much fun it was to be on that team last year, even though they might not have been getting a ton of at bats. And they did recognize how special that group was and how fun it was. And, uh, you know, they've made it 
they made a conscious effort to try to recreate that feeling inside the clubhouse and that way they approach their, you know, their training every day. Um, they want to try to replicate those behaviors. Mike, I didn't get the chance to see it in Kansas City, but just judging by the reports, and I think you guys had a 430 team on base percentage over those two games, which was pretty terrific against anybody, much less Oklahoma State. But seeing guys like Matt Hogan and Dominic Keegan, Keegan's a name that probably the diehard fans know. Most may not know Hogan. Just talk about some of your newer guys that have really stepped up and what you saw out of them this weekend. Yeah, that's that's what's good about the fall. You know, we've got a couple guys that have um, been injured, um, you know, and are nursing those and kind of coming back at, at various points as we move forward. But what's good is some of the other guys were able to jump in and, and, and get experience like we talked about earlier. So, um, you know, both the guys you referenced, Keegan and Hogan, they had very good weekends. I would say um, Hogan has, has – really impressed this fall from um, a consistency standpoint in, in terms of his at-bats. I think he, we talk about winning pitches all the time and um, he's done a really good job of that in our scrimmages so far. And, and that's a big jump from him last year. I think he's a year older inside the program. I think, um, you know, he, he's got a better idea of our expectations and how to navigate them and how to be himself at the same time. And, and that that's when guys really start to take off. So, it's been good to see him. He's doing well. He's worked on his defense out in the outfield. He, he something that didn't get brought up in the box scores or the reports. He, he played a very, very good center field and outfield, and he made numerous good plays. So that was good. Um, you know, he's doing what he has to do right now, and, and he's definitely playing playing at a good level. And it was good to get him an opportunity to get out there and play. Um, yeah, Dominic is a guy that, like you said, I think maybe more fans know about him right now, um, but he he has the potential to be a, a, a good, powerful hitter. Um, and, you know, he's making some adjustments from an approach standpoint. And I think when when he's an aggressive hitter and an, an aggressive mentality, I think that's when his game rushed He did very well this weekend. And getting back to that mindset um, in every at-bat, in every pitch that he saw, um, and hopefully he kind of stays on that track because I think that's when his natural game comes out um, to its highest level. Mike, your outfield, just for the sake of this question, hypothetically speaking, let's say you go with Cooper Davis, Austin Martin, Isaiah Thomas. That's an outstanding outfield, probably. Uh, But a lot of years, you guys have seven or eight guys that can play out there. And, of course, Austin, I think, also getting audition at shortstop a little bit. You got Hogan out there, too, but there's maybe the depth is a little, from what I look at when I see your roster, not quite what it is. Some years, uh, maybe you guys have some players there that I'm not thinking about, but how, how do you accept that? Uh, excuse me, how do you assess that from a depth standpoint? Is that a concern at this point? Uh, no, it's just so early. You know, it, it's so early to know who ends up where. I think if you asked us where Austin Martin ends up his freshman year, you would have no idea, and he played everywhere. You know, and, and you, you probably can look at this group now and you see a bunch of really – good athletic players that have the capability of maybe training a lot in the infield to see how that goes. And then if they're showing a high level at bat consistently, maybe they bump out to the outfield. So, you know, outfielders, like by definition, by, you know, strictly outfielders, it's probably lighter in numbers than it has been in the past. But, you know, you're looking at two guys on the team right now, whether it's Austin Martin or Harrison Ray, and not saying either one of them are going to play outfield. You know, I think we're all trying to figure out where all the pieces fit, but I feel comfortable with either one of those guys in center field tomorrow. Um, you know, so are they, you know, strictly outfielders? No. Uh, are they athletes? Absolutely. Can they play the middle of the field? Yes. So um, on paper, uh, or if I'm with the guys in training and it's just four or five of us out there, um, it's more because we want to just continue to develop the skill set of the other players in the infield and, and we trust their ability to slide out there um, in the spring if we need them to and jump in and, and, and train in the outfield. One more question for me before I get into some from our listeners. Shortstop, that's a big hole that you've had left there from Ethan Paul and Connor Kaiser from before that. What do you make of Tate Colwick at this stage? Tate's training hard, uh, and he's in that mix. And where we're at right now is – trying to figure out what it's going to look like in February. And obviously 
it's going to look different in March and April than it did in February. And hopefully in June, you know, we're still going and it might look very different than what it looks like in October. So um, Tate's definitely in that mix. Uh, Sterling's in that mix. Obviously you got two players that have been in the program for a year and have trained consistently and have an idea of what we're looking for and, and know how to impact the team. Um, obviously the, then the usual suspects, you got Harrison and Austin Martin and, and some newcomers with Duff and Young and, and TJ McKenzie. Who take, TJ's taking more reps in the outfield right now, but he jumps in the out in the infield and, you know, he's historically a high school shortstop. So there are guys there and it's way too early to kind of figure out um, who's who and, and who's going to own these spots and, you know, or who's going to rent them first, as we like to say, but, uh, you know, Tate has the intangibles that uh, are always intriguing. I think he's really beloved in the clubhouse. I know that as a freshman last year, he made quite an impact inside the group um, socially. Uh, I know they really enjoyed being around him and, and they respect the way he trains and, and he, he does, he brings it every day and, and he's a pretty good athlete. So the opportunity is there. Um, if he continues to go out and, and play at a high level, he's going to, you know, get himself some time. And, and that's, what's really exciting about where we're at organizationally right now. There's a ton of opportunity for guys to come in and, and just prove that they, they deserve those spots. Our mailbag is presented by Vanderbilt fan and independent insurance agent Josh Minton of Brentwood. If you need home, auto, motorcycle, renters, landlord, life, or commercial insurance, Josh can help you out. Call him at 615-933-1979. Email him at josh at hqinsurance.com. Follow him at JD Minton HQ on Facebook. He's my insurance agent. Give him a try, and I think you'll be pleased. VU Smackdown says two seasons ago, many felt the team underperformed in hitting and in terms of plate approach. Last year was much improved, obviously. What do you think changed, and what are your expectations for this season? I don't describe the one mechanical set of, you know, teaching cues. Uh, I never really believed in that for hitting. Uh, I think, you know, there are some fundamentals from a, a physical standpoint that you want guys to achieve, and, you know, we want to make sure those are there in the swings. But uh, we want guys to be themselves – from a physical standpoint um, and move athletically um, to the best of their ability. And I think when you start trying to bucket guys up and, and teach a, a mechanical pattern, I think the first thing that you lose is um, a mentality inside the box in the game. And to me, that's, that's the most important thing. It's also the hardest to train. Um, and I think it's also the hardest for the player to believe is the most important thing, especially with as much access they have the information right now via social media um, at their fingertips, you know, the modern player is um, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of information that's accessible. And I think the best hitters in the world have find, they find ways to keep this game as simple as possible. And from a teaching standpoint, you know, to the group, we have, you know, group level teaching, and then we have obviously individual teaching, but the group level teaching that we try to employ, it focuses primarily on, how you're attacking the pitcher and what your process is in the box between pitches. So, uh, you know, I thought last year was very, very good. Um, part of that, you know, the, what makes that good is a slow heartbeat, to be honest with you. I think the slow heartbeat for the hitter is the first component to being able to employ a really good solid approach. And, and that comes a little bit with experience, but it also really comes with knowing who you are. And that's what we were talking about with Paul and Scott earlier. I think, identifying the type of hitter you are and how you affect the offense gives you the ability to have a slow heartbeat, gives you the ability to be, you know, really mentally engaged and focus on what's happening pitch to pitch. When you don't know who you are, you're trying to be somebody you're not, or you let the moment consume you. The last thing you're thinking about inside the box is the pitch that's coming. You usually are worried about your swing. You're trying to think about something mechanical and that's a really dangerous place to be as a hitter. So um, you know, I, I thought this last year was good um, and, you know, it is hopefully, you know, the model that we want to continue to use. And we, we hope that the players and as we move forward, really see the value in approaching the game simply um, and with simplicity and, and a good presence mentally uh, inside their at-bats. BU65 says or wants to know if you've been surprised by the performance of any particular freshman. This fall? Yes. Um, yeah, there's some guys that, you know, surprised. 
not sure I'd say surprised. I think, you know, there's some guys that have really jumped in and, and, and hit at a high level. I think Spencer Jones is the first name that comes to mind. I think he has done a really good job putting his barrel on the ball and controlling his at-bats. I think he, you know, he's made a lot of contact and he's, he's got a lot of hits so far, you know, just from a statistical standpoint. So he's had some really good at-bats. Um, you know, Parker Nolan is uh, another name that comes to mind early. Um, I think for me, I, I just look at the, the overall quality of the at-bat, you know, how hard is it to get out? How does he control the strike zone? Um, can he take the borderline pitch early? Um, and can he, you know, and he make an adjustment with two strikes. And, you know, I, I think so far Parker's done a pretty good job of that. Spencer's done a good job. TJ McKenzie, um, he put a really good swing on the ball the other day. Um, I would say it was the best swing of his fall so far. You know, that was good. Um, and then you got guys like, you know, Duff and McKenzie are both really good athletes. Um, Duff has a – Duff is – he, he's got a really good advanced approach at the plate. So, you know, I put him in that first bucket of guys that can control the strike zone pretty consistently they can see breaking pitch as well um and they can work in a bat so uh to surprise i wouldn't say that as much i just think you know they've uh they've done what we'd hope they could do so far and obviously there's a lot of growth still left in front of them um and then there's some other guys that have been dinged up a little bit that are you know kind of getting their feet under them from a um, you know a playing perspective in that group but um those, those are i'd say so far the guys that are you know putting up some consistent at bats Mike, I want to ask you a question about Spencer Jones. I'm going to start it with the preface just for our listening audience. What Mike is saying is not coach speak about roles and who might fit there and possibilities and moving guys around. I've I've seen it so many times following your program. I know that that's the truth. That's not just a a soundbite to put out there for whatever reason. But with Spencer, so many possibilities with him. I know he came in as a possible two-way player. I know, I think he's about 6'7". I hear that he's got really good speed. What are the possibilities of where he fits for you maybe this year and down the road? Yeah, he's a two-way potential. He's, you know, he, he hasn't pitched yet for us. He's building up some arm strength. Um, but in high school, he, you know, he had left-handed velocity. Um, so, um you know, that, that's a possibility in the future. Right now, he's been a primary position player for us um, as he's kind of building up that arm strength back. Um, he's got good speed underway, um, better speed than you would think for his size uh, once he gets going. He's more of a first or third runner than he's a home to first runner, but he can still get down the line. But I think his best event would be a little bit longer stretch. Um, and, and, you know, from a defensive standpoint, we, we put him at first. He's taken some reps in the outfield. I think it's a luxury to have a, a left-handed first baseman, um, somebody with, with good hands, and, and he's shown the ability to pick the ball pretty well. He made a good backhand play um, out in Oklahoma State in that game where he, it was actually the first ball hit to him from a right-handed bat, which is always a tricky play for the offside infielder um, just because it's usually deflected um, and usually has some energy. And He made a really good play to his backhand side there. And, you know, I, I think more than anything, just to describe him, I think he moves better than you would expect for such a, a large young man, you know, for such a tall young man. And he's got a lot of room for added strength. So um, he's got versatility because of the athleticism, I would say right now. Um, I, I think at first base, he's, he's, he's doing pretty well and showing the ability to keep the ball in front of him and, and get keep it in his glove. And obviously he's left-handed. So, um, you know, that like I said, that's a luxury in the infield. Hardcore Door has a question about the upperclassmen, wants to know which players you've noticed who seem to have taken big steps forward since last year. Um, well, we talked about two of them. You know, I, I think Dominic and Hogan um, are the first two that jumped to my mind. Uh, I think when you talk about Harrison and Tyler Duvall, you're looking at two guys who, you know, Doobie's been a little banged up. He hasn't played much, um, but he'll be good to go. But what what you do see – in that fourth year player is it's, it's like, it's almost like they, they realize their role and they own it, you know, and they come in and and they want more responsibility from a leadership standpoint. And to watch that, to watch their personalities and not shift, but grow um, into these, you know, leader roles, that's been really good to see. And, And that was a hope of ours. And when Doobie told us he was coming back to school, we were thrilled about that because you could see how much, 
you could see the power of a uh, older group and, and what it can get you last year, just in terms of clubhouse stability. And those two guys have done a really good job of that. Um, a couple other guys are hurt. Uh, you know, Jay Henry Malloy is working hard. Um, I think he's coming in and, and he wants to, you know, tighten up the game a little bit from an offensive standpoint. And, and he's been pretty deliberate uh, in his work. And, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see that play out. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of guys that they can see the opportunity and, and they're staying focused on, on trying to grab it. Next one comes from VU65. He wants to know the status of Austin Martin since he was on crutches at the ring ceremony. Yeah, he's good. He's, he's improving. Um, you know, whether or not he gets out in the fall, I'm not sure. I mean, he's, 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 he's progressing very well. And he, you know, he's out to batting practice now from an offensive standpoint. And, um, he's right where he needs to be. So he's been good. And, and what he's done a good job of you know, while he has, you know, been injured, he, he's done a good job being part of the group and, and, and making sure he's out there and training. He's around the, he's around the, the batting cage with the guys on the field and he's down in the cages with us uh, prior to training, making sure, you know, he's just inside the group and, and that's good. And, and it kind of falls back in line with that leadership we were just talking about with Doobie and Harry, I think Austin, Austin understands his role here as well. And, and, and he's, you know, he's a year older and that's, that's good because he's obviously a good player, but he needs to get better and, and he's working on it too. And, and that's the thing. He, he wants to come here. And he wants to, he wants to continue to improve. And I give him credit for that. Boy, this could really be a long answer. Chester Copperpot wants to know what makes Austin Martin such a good hitter. Confident. <laughs> it's a simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot yeah. shorter than I expected. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I mean, if you kind of hear what we're saying and what I'm saying, it it starts with their awareness of who they are and what they do, and then two, how confident are they? And, and baseball is it's a, the most challenging sport, obviously, from a, a technical skill perspective. It's extremely hard to hit, and then. More than anything, it's the ability to keep your mind in a good space to be present when you get the opportunity to play because, you know, you, you fail so much. And that's an old thing to say, but it's true. And, um, you know, what Austin does, I mean, deeper than that, it, you know, he's very good. He, he has a good knack of the strike zone. He can see multiple pitches, you know, and he can see, pick up spin very well. So the approach, teachings and ideas, I mean, it comes very naturally to him. Uh, you know, that's more of a technical evaluation, but... Um, you, you know, I, I do think there's a lot that can be made up for a hitter um, in their mind and, and their ability to compete uh, and, and not get in their own way by trying to make a skill that needs to be autonomous and, and let your body take over. Um, when you make a cerebral and you try to you try to steer yourself through a swing, you're not going to get results. It's not it's not possible, especially in a, in a game setting. So. Austin does a really good job of staying away from all that. Um, and, you know, what he did well last year, um, he didn't chase the power. You know, he, he he wanted to lead the conference in hitting, and he did, you know, at least in the re- – I think at the end, but in the regular season. And he stayed true to what his game is. I think when he takes what the pitcher gives him and, and he hits line drives, he'll get to plenty of power, but he'll be on base a lot and he'll do it. But – like I said, I mean, he's on a mission to improve, and I think he, he's going to. You know, he's got to continue to work, and he's got to continue to get better because that's that's where you're at in this game. I think he can, you know, refine refine the approach more and, and obviously continue to work on both sides of the ball, offensively and defensively, to, to be the best version of himself. And, you know, he, he's got the right mindset for that. When he hits the field, man, that guy just wants to compete. So, um you know, that's what separates him from a lot of players is his ability to be very present and competitive in the game. And, and he's a very, very confident kid. Dryce Brew would like to know how J.J. Blade improved so much as a hitter. It falls in line um, with Austin, a different personality, um, but both had an awareness of who they were you know, and who they are. And what JJ really trusted was that the power is the last thing to develop. And he still is not fully developed by any means. You know, he needs to continue on the pro side. He'll tap into his power in a few more years, probably as he learns to navigate that world. But 
um, JJ never rushed that process. Uh, and JJ was always focused on being a really good hitter and his work and his routine, I would say over the years, it got more deliberate and it got more focused on what made him good. And part of that was, you know, mobility through his core. And he is a very strong kid and he's got a lot of, you know, strength in his legs and his forearms and it creates a ton of bat speed. But I think as a younger player, he's a little bit stiffer version of himself. And uh, over his course of time here, he really dedicated himself to um, a good mobility stretching program with coach Ham and Tracy, our trainer. And some of it was a byproduct from his oblique injury the year prior. Um, it's kind of got him going on that, but what he did was he, he held on to it. And I mean, before he would take a swing in a cage, he was doing a, a 10 to 20 minute flexibility mobility routine down in the cage where he's moving around, stretching and doing various exercises. And, you know, I do believe that, um, you know, his dedication to that and, I think it let him tap into a little bit more dynamic movement in his swing to be able to cover more of the strike zone and keep his barrel on the ball longer, which obviously helps you spin the ball better and get you, get, you know, maximizes your bat speed to get the ball over the fence. Um, but when you look at his at-bats as a freshman and a sophomore, and obviously he was hurt as a sophomore and as a junior, that, that's, a, that's a guy that knew the zone. You know, he, he knew the strike zone. He was able to control it. He was able to put his barrel on the ball. And then obviously when you combine – you know, his physical skills and then a solid approach. Um, you know, you could see what could happen last year and, and he did that, but there's no one aha moment. There wasn't like, Oh, he did this with his mechanics and changed now, oh, man. I mean, it, it was a guy that got really, really good at being present and a guy that trusted his results. He just, he wanted and, and and it really maximizes the quality of his at-bats. And then, you know, he focused on, on being healthy. Got about five minutes left. I'll get in a few more. This one out of your jurisdiction, but obviously your practice every day. B3 Vanity wants to know if Tyler Brown will be moved to starting pitching. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I, it's a better question for Brown long-term. Uh, you, know, you know, Scott Brown, um, I'm not sure. Um, you know, he was, he was excellent in his role last year. Um, I don't know what his, you know, personal desire is. And I do know that his main objective here is to win and to impact the team. And I know he, you know, he really thrived in his role last year and I know he enjoyed it. So I, I don't, I couldn't tell you what, what the plan is directly with him. I'm not sure. And Arbordor says, if I'm not mistaken, every fall the baseball players go through a process of earning their Vanderbilt gear. Can you talk about that, how it works, and what they are expected to do? Yeah, they're they're expected to come in and and give us their their best focus and energy, and and really understand the standards of the program. Um, I think you know there's there's a few reasons why that's in place and. Um, more than anything, I think it's just understanding the value of the equipment, you know, the logo, um, being part of the program. Um, there's a lot to that, you know, and I, I think to be a new player in this program, um, you know, it's our expectation when you come in that you're going to understand the history of the program. And then you're also going to try to leave your mark on it and further the program. Um, and I think, you know, just that example of earning their equipment and, and the logo and everything like that is is just a, a strategy to try to help inform them of you know why they have access to the resources they do and, and also inspire them to try to improve those resources for the you know the groups that are going to come behind them party at robs would like to know will the new artificial turf play differently from the old and if so how it's Currently a little bit slower. Um, I think that old turf, you know, the it got a little bit compacted underneath. So obviously it played faster than most surfaces. Anytime you get a new surface that's artificial, it's going to tend to be a little bit slower. Um, and then as it breaks in, the fibers will lay down a little bit. And I think you'll see the speed of the ground balls um, increase a little bit. So I, I would imagine when we get rolling in the spring, it's going to be too far off. I think 
it's going to drain a lot better and I'm looking outside now and there's no puddles. So that's good. Um, and we're excited about that, but I do know, uh, you know, we want to kind of fine tuned and calibrate a certain way. And, uh, we like a certain style of play. We like a fast paced play and, and we want a fast paced surface. Last one from Utah, Ozzy. If you could only teach young kids one fundamental thing about hitting to make them successful, what would that be? Be committed to being on time for a pitch. Um, and it's a little bit of a toothier idea, I guess, just because young kids don't have to worry so much about breaking pitches and off speed pitches. But if you want to be a good ki- a good hitter, you got to command the fastball. It starts there. And I think at bats, they get thrown away so frequently when a player is not committed. He thinks he's committed to the fastball, but he's worried about the off speed pitch or, you know, there's something in the back of his head that doesn't have him really engaged. And, you know, I always tell our guys, you can give, I'll take a guy with a bad swing, but a really good mental approach that can get in the box and, and compete as opposed to the prettiest swing in batting practice, but doesn't have a plan at the plate or can't be committed to hitting at speed at the plate because he's easily pitched to. And, you know, to play at the highest levels, you're going to need, um, you know, the advanced mentality to be present and, and, and to have a plan and, and to stick to the plan and not let the pitcher take you for a ride around your at bat. Um, and I think, you know, I don't know what age you're talking about, you know, a five-year-old probably not, but, you know, I think you're talking about a high school player, you know, that wants to play college baseball. I think that's a, a pretty good idea to start from. And really what I would ask whoever asked that question or whoever's talking about hitting development, it's like, I think as you move up higher and higher, you know, how much of the training time are you spending focusing on what you're actually going to have to do inside of a game where there's variability, there's different speeds, there's different pitches, there's different locations, you know, and I think just from a training standpoint, I think there's a lot of resources, both financially and time that are spent strictly in a vacuum, you know, where you're maybe you're hitting off a tee or a good VP, nice predictable pitch, and you just focus on how you're moving. And, you know, generally when you're a hitter um, and you have your best days, you're never thinking that way, you know, um, usually a lot more external and you're a lot more focused on what's happening in front of you. So that's a little bit longer answer, um, but I would tell, I would tell a young player or a high school age player to start thinking about what he's going to have to do to be successful at the next level and, and make sure that the training and that the time they're doing from a developmental standpoint reflects that to some degree. Obviously it can't be all about that, but you know, all too often I feel like it's never that in that when they come here and they have to take a step up and in competition and face better pitching, um, they don't always have the tools, you know, from an approach, a mental standpoint, to go out and play. Um, you know, I think that that's where some of that adjustment has to come in. Mike, I really appreciate your time. That was a terrific segment we just had. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to catching you guys in some of the scrimmage games coming up. Yeah. It'd be good to see you out there. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on. It was good, good chatting with you. You bet. He's Mike Baxter, hitting coach for Vanderbilt. I'm Chris Lee, the host of the Vandy Sports Podcast. We appreciate you listening. We'll have one more episode coming later this week.